I'm already like right. in the middle of studying. Thank you everybody for being again. here tonight. We're going to get started and thank you everyone virtually who is joining in. Uh, tonight our topic is understanding and identifying suicide risk. Megan Walsh, Megan, thank you for being here tonight, Absolutely. is a licensed clinical professional counselor who has been with Linden Oaks Behavioral Health for four years before transitioning to the marketing department to uh, assist with business development and new initiatives. She was part of the leadership team for the assessment and referral center. Megan has 10 plus years of experience in behavioral health field, including community counseling and work at a domestic violence shelter. Megan has been a volunteer with the Animal Assisted Therapy Program at Linden Oaks in the past with her Black Lab Mix, Bailey, and is currently looking for a new canine companion to be her partner. Welcome again. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, having me come out. Um, and I have to say, um, so we're going to be talking about understanding and identifying suicide risk. And... Um, I just, I will say uh, when kind of the request came through for this presentation, um, I was I was a little bit like, physical therapist, that doesn't make any sense, right? Why, they're not, you know, they're not primary care doctors. People aren't going to them to talk about depression or anxiety or things like that. Um, and and that was a little short-sighted of myself, right? I actually had to take the step back and say, you know what? people that have a mental illness, they do not exist within a vacuum, right? They do not just go from their house to, you know, their doctor or, or things like that, right? They're out there in the world. They are running into um, other professions, into other providers, right? They're going to the dentist's office. They're going to the pet store. They're coming oftentimes to, to all of you for physical therapy, right? Maybe after um, an, a, a car accident, uh, or maybe some of the things that they're dealing with is because of a medical condition, right? And, and as we go through, we're definitely gonna talk about that, how so often that goes hand in hand. So I do wanna say thank you everyone who, who kind of is here in person, and thank you everyone who is with us virtually. Um, thank you for uh, being open-minded, right? More so than I was at first, and um, looking to take care of your patients in a very um, collaborative but very, very open way, right? Just, just very well-rounded, kind of top to bottom, inside and out. Uh, I, I really hope that everybody gets something out of this, um, and you're going to be able to care for your patients uh, that much better. So thank you, everyone. Um, alrighty, so what we should be, hopefully everyone is going to walk away today, being able to identify signs and symptoms of depression. We want to know about what the risk factors for depression and suicide are. Um, what are the warning signs of suicide? And then what are the appropriate responses for intervention, right? What happens? Okay, great. I know all the warning signs and I can identify it. Now what kind of thing, right? I want to make sure that you're walking out of here uh, with some tools um, it, it, in case that situation ever does come up. Um, all right, so our summary, um, which kind of went out, right? Physical injury can absolutely cause feelings of depression and anxiety as it disrupts normal functioning, right? Um, physical therapists see patients who may be experiencing these feelings acutely. You're working with them on a, on a very intimate basis, right? And oftentimes, for an extended period of time. You're developing really close relationships with, with these people. Um, that makes you perfect for being able to identify uh, when somebody's maybe struggling with some of these issues, right? A lot of times they may be telling you things that they don't share with their partner or their friends or family members or even their doctors. Um, so knowing the signs and symptoms of suicide risk really makes it easier to help connect the person to the resources that they need right, and assist them in their overall recovery process. And that's, that's what we're looking for, right, kind of overall well-being and health, um, both mentally and physically. Uh, so what we're going to look for, so the, this present, presentation is going to define what depression looks like, how it can impact people in different ways, because we are all different and things are going to touch us and impact us in different ways. 
Um, what are the risk factors that contribute to depression and can lead to suicidal thoughts? Uh, once the warning signs of suicide are identified, various interventions and responses will be discussed, as well as how to best support someone, right, who may be at risk for suicide. This is very informal. Please holler out if you have questions, anything like that, right? I love the feedback. I, I'd love this to be kind of a conversation with us uh, along the way, okay? Alrighty, so um, as she mentioned, I'm with uh, Linden Oaks Behavioral Health. Um, I have been there, gosh, about four years now. Um, blessed to have been in the basic, uh, our version of the psychiatric emergency room, right? So we saw anything and everything kind of coming in. Um, so identifying suicide risk, assessing for that, knowing how to respond to that, that is now kind of a like a second skin that I wear wherever I go now. Um, so if I get a little carried away, I get, I get a little passionate about this, this topic, right? So feel free to be like, okay, you're going off into left field, Meg, bring it back. Um, all right, so these are our objectives, which we're going. Um, so first, uh, before we can jump to suicide, we need to kind of start at ground zero, right? Mental illness, what is that? What does that look like? Um, so what it is, kind of textbook, right? It's a diagnosable illness uh, that is impacting a person's thinking, emotional state, and their behavior, right? So kind of those, those three pieces. Um, and it's disrupting the person's ability to, it's kind of daily functioning, right? Going to work or going to school, um, carrying out daily activities. That includes showering, getting dressed, um, cleaning the house, going grocery shopping, paying the bills, things along those lines, and then engaging in satisfying relationships. So there, it's, it's a change in their role, right? All of us have different roles that we play in our lives. Um, it can be a wife, can be a husband, can be a parent, uh, can be a student, can be a coworker or, or an employee, right? Um, a, mental, a mental illness is impacting our ability to do that function, right? To carry out that role. Um, we're not able to parent our children quite as effectively as we were before, right? We might be relying a little bit more on, you know, our partner, our husband, our wife, um, whoever it may be. Um, going to work, okay, great, I'm, I'm here and I'm showing up, but uh, I'm kind of phoning it in. Right, I can't really focus. I keep getting distracted. Um, maybe I can't go to work. Maybe I'm calling in sick uh, with school. Right, I can't go to class. Maybe I'm going to the nurse's office a lot. Um, kind of all along those lines. Those are all kind of indications that that there's something else going on there. Um, okay, so fact or fiction. Uh, mental illness is a sign of weakness or it's a personality flaw. What do you guys think? Fact? Fiction? Fiction. Fiction? fiction. Mm -hmm. Definitely fiction. Um, you know, you think um, sign of weakness, right? Just snap out of it. What do you, just, well, you just, that's not so bad, right? Just, just smile. Like, just get over it. Like, like it's okay, right? You can, you can do it. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> it's a disease. It's a disease. Trust me. If these people, if it was within their power to feel better, they would do whatever possible, right? They do not want to feel like this. It is, it is a dark place to be. If it was a matter of just, oh, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, if it was that easy, they would be doing it, right? Um, it can't be willed away, right? And oftentimes ignoring the problem is going to make it worse uh, because, oh, nope, it's, it's fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, there's nothing wrong. He, see, look, I, I can smile, I'll make myself smile. It's gonna end up, it's not going to go away on its own and it could become a bigger problem down the line. Uh, so people with mental illness are violent, right? True, false? No, no, no. 50-50. 50-50? And that's, you know, I mean, open the newspaper, turn on the news, right? A lot of times you might be hearing some of those stories. Um, you know, so-and-so, right, we've got a tragedy, so-and-so went out and, 
you know, shot a bunch of people or did this or did that, right? A lot of times you'll hear, oh, well, they were mentally ill. So of course that can lead to very much kind of this thinking of, oh, people that, that are mentally ill, they have a mental illness, of course they're more violent, right? They're gonna be more inclined to do this. Um, actually, statistics show uh, that more than a quarter of persons with mental illness were victims of a violent crime in the past year. So that is a rate that is more than 11 times higher than somebody without a mental illness. So they've, they've looked at this, right, time and time again. A person that has a mental illness is actually more inclined to be the victim of violence rather than be the perpetrator. It's just, it's all sometimes in our society a matter of that filter, that lens that you look through things. And sometimes what is reported um, it's not necessarily what's true or, or kind of the reality, right? The bigger picture. Uh, all right, healthy people, right? They aren't affected by traumatic events. And if they are, you know, it's, it's just because they really do have a mental health issue, right? No. no. I mean, tell me, right? You, you work with people who have experienced a traumatic event, I'm sure, right? Car accidents, sports and uh, anything along those lines, right? A stroke, mm -hmm. right, TBI, um, Parkinson's, right, uh, thing, cancer, uh, anything along those lines, right? There is no, oh, you're healthy, you're unhealthy, right? Traumatic events affects us all, every single person, right? In fact, um, uh, Viktor Frankl, who is kind of a founding person in, in psychiatry, psychology, uh, he's fantastic. He is a um, survivor of the Holocaust, was in the concentration camps. Um, he says, he's got, a, he's got a great quote, and I'm going to read it so I make sure I don't mess it up. An abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. An uncommon, right, an, an unexpected something and, and a unnatural thing that happens you are going to have a different reaction to it, right? In fact, to not react to that would be strange, to not have a reaction. So absolutely, there's no healthy, unhealthy kind of thing. Um, and so it's, it's nice because you've already been exposed, you're already working with it through your patients, so, so you've been able to kind of see this um, for a fact that it is not true. Um, which is great. So this is just kind of a little funny. Uh, so some helpful advice, right? So the first one that you've got up here, you got somebody in bed and they're kind of oh, really sick and they've got a thermometer, right? And the helpful person is saying, well, I get that you have food poisoning and all, but you have to at least make an effort, right? Uh, oh, we've got this gentleman, blood spurting out of his, out of his arm, his hand, right? And this very helpful person is saying, you know, you just need to change your frame of mind. Uh, then you'll feel better. And this very sad soul is kind of hunched over, you know, hunched over the toilet. And this one is like, well, have you tried, you know, haven't you tried just like, you know, not having the flu? <laughs> sure, because that'll work. Uh, this one, right, looking like he's giving himself a shot possibly for diabetes or some other kind of um, condition. You know, I don't think it's healthy that you have to take medication every day just to feel normal. Don't you worry that it's changing you from who you really are? So it's, it's kind of right taking, taking that filter of, of kind of the comments and statements and kind of perceptions that people have about mental illness, right? And you just kind of change it. You take that same wording and you actually, and you talk to somebody in a different circumstance, it kind of sounds how ridiculous it is, right? Uh, we've got this one, right? He's, he's bleeding from his stomach and does not look very, in, <laughs> very good. And this guy, you know, it's like you're not even trying. You're sitting there, you're bleeding, you're not even trying, what are you, what are you doing? Uh, we've got this gentleman who's, you know, hooked up in the hospital it looks like, right? He's got his IV, all of that good stuff. Well, lying in bed obviously isn't helping you. 
you, you just need to try something else. <laughs> just, just get up, right? You're, you're in the hospital. Just, just get up. You're lying in bed. It's not helping you. Who are these people giving that? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty ridiculous, right? Like when you think about it. And these are the things that are said to people that have mental illness. And you kind of put it in a different context and you're just like, wow. Kind of makes it look a little different there. <laughs> Um, okay, so can anybody guess uh, like what percentage of people have a mental illness? Like one out of what? Any guess? I, 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 don't know, I would say like maybe three or four out of ten. Okay. Or so, I don't know. Okay. Well, really? I'm not sure. Well, I'm, I'm counting things like anxiety and depression, mm -hmm. which I mean, and looking through patient charts in my clinicals, it seems like so many people. Yep. So many people have that. Okay. Like, so I don't know. Okay. Include that. Okay. Anybody else? I find depression more common in older patients. In older patients? Okay. So like what percentage? I don't know. Ten percent. Eighty 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 percent. Mm hmm Yep, absolutely. Okay. Any other guesses? No? What would you say, uh, what would you say is the most common mental illness that people have? Anxiety. Don't say depression. Anxiety, depression. Any other guesses? Those are, you would think, kind of the two top two, possibly. Whoop. There we go. Whoa. <laughs> now it went crazy. All right. One in five adults have a mental illness in any one year, right? So they're looking at kind of 12 consecutive months. And they've done, uh, so this is a study that is um, done by, uh, it's a large national survey. It's called the National Comorbidity Survey. Um, it was published in 2007. So they, huge, right? And they did it nationwide. One in five adults have a mental illness in any one year. All right, so how many people are in this room? One, two, three. <laughs> 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 right. Absolutely, right? So everybody, in some way, in some way, shape, or form, right, is going to be impacted by mental illness. It could be temporary. It, absolutely. Accident, sure. Or, you know, Without a doubt. The family has yeah. a diagnosis mm -hmm. of cancer. You feel it. Absolutely. Or your child absolutely. is very sick and you cannot mm -hmm. take the time off from right. working. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the matter gets better, symptoms right. disappear now without right. even treatment. It's a situation sometimes. Yeah. Just because you have, um, so, so, sorry, I'm going to. Versus, I'm going to repeat it for my online people. I'm sorry if I was forgetting to do that earlier, guys. Uh, so um, you were saying that kind of a depression can kind of come and go, right? So it comes after maybe a family member is diagnosed with cancer, um, there's a car accident, something like that, right? But that the symptoms kind of get better. Um, that's absolutely correct. Just because you are, uh, just because at some point in time you have a mental illness does not mean that that is a lifelong thing that you have to deal with, right? That's, that's some people, yes, that's kind of a lifelong thing that they will, that they will work with, right? Kind of managing, just like a chronic medical condition. Uh, and then other people, you know, car accident, perfect example, or a sports injury, okay, I have this, and it may take a year, two years of kind of ongoing treatment and things along those lines, um, but then you get better, right? The symptoms go away, you're kind of in recovery, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in any one year, right, 18.5% of adults in America have a mental illness. That's 43.8 million people in the US. That's like mind blowing. That's a lot of people, that's a lot of people. And anxiety, who said anxiety? Yep, anxiety is the most common mental health illness in any one year, right? So 18.1% is anxiety. 
Uh, now, somebody else said depression, right? That that's kind of, that should be up there, either number one or number two. Um, it is actually 6.8%. So it is below substance use disorder. And you don't always think about kind of substance use, right, as, as kind of a mental illness, but it is. It is. Uh, bipolar, right, things like that, 2.8%, very small percentage. Anxiety. And if you think about it, look at our society. We're, we're overscheduled, we're overworked, we're over everything, right? I mean, do you sometimes see people who just are almost vibrating, right, with kind of like, oh, I have to do this and I have to get this done, and it's just, ah, uh, right? Sometimes I feel that myself. I'm like, oh, okay, time to reframe, time to take a step back, right? Because you're just like, ah. You ever walk into a room or like meet with somebody and you can feel their anxiety like coming at you? Do you ever have patients that you're working with where you can, like, I would imagine, can you feel it in their bodies? <laughs> yes, yeah, any examples? Tight muscles. Tight muscles, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah, can't. Constant delegate, do nothing works right for me. Okay. Even though you feel like you tried your best. You're trying your best, but they're always saying it doesn't work, it doesn't work, it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Anxiety, anxiety is a killer. It's there and it, like, it never goes away. It's, um, if you think about it, it's, it's uh, people that live with anxiety, right? Kind of um, diagnosable. It's, like they're walking around and their antennas are fully exposed and it's like an exposed nerve walking around for them if you can if you can imagine that right like you're hyper aware you have everything kind of tense and ready to spring and whoa what's going to come through that door and what's going to come over here and what's this person going to do to me it's exhausting it's exhausting yeah a lot of people with um, chronic Bronchitis or emphysema. Oh, okay. Or asthma, Chronic and bronchitis. Oxygen dependent. Okay. A lot of times they'll be very anxious. So somebody with chronic, uh, chronic bronchitis, um, chronic emphysema, need the <laughs> ongoing oxygen, are, are, can be really uh, tense and anxious. Is that, I mean, do they speak about a specific anxiety that they have with that? Some people do, but you can a lot of times see it in their body. So you can see it kind of in their body. How they're sitting and you know that they're using a lot of extra muscles that they don't need to use hmm. to sit there. So you kind of see it in their body. They're sitting there like kind of their shoulders are pulled up, right? Their, their arms may be pulled in a little bit, kind of hands and fists, kind of using all these extra muscles that you typically don't need if you're just kind of just sitting in a chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Sometimes they say that person who has a respiratory illness yeah. they cannot fall asleep in the night with the fear and anxiety that they won't be able to breathe if they fall asleep. Oh, that's a great kind of anxiety fear, right? So um, kind of it was for our online people, uh, it was brought up um, people that have those, those breathing issues, those breathing conditions, they have that fear of falling asleep um, because the thought is, if I fall asleep, I won't be able to breathe, and maybe I won't wake up. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you have, you know, you have to have that kind of constant oxygen. It's it's, and I would imagine um, very impactful for for you working with these patients, kind of day in and day out, um, to really be able to see sort of this physical impact that this. That things like this have on have on your patients, yeah. All right, so we did mental illness. So let's jump into um, let's jump into depression. Um, all right. So depression. So this is kind of the textbook definition, right? So major depression disorder. This is something that has to. It's lasting for at least two weeks, right? So the symptoms are lasting for at least two weeks. And it's impacting a person's emotions, their thinking behavior, uh, kind of cognitive stuff going on, and then physical well-being. Uh, and then again, we've got the ability to work and have um, satisfying relationships, right? Kind of being able to fulfill those roles that we uh, that we hold within society and within our, our our relationships, and then ability to carry out usual daily activities. 
So that again is going back to the getting up, getting dressed, um, putting on clean clothes as opposed to picking up, you know, whatever is on the floor and putting that on. Um, uh, you know, doing the grocery shopping, paying those bills, cleaning the house, kind of that, you know, the mundane day-to-day -day things that we do that you just don't think about it when you're, when you're not struggling with depression. Um, okay, so especially since I'm sure everybody's seen this uh, with your patients, what are some signs and symptoms um, of depression that you've noticed uh, maybe with your patients? I mean, aside from, yes, you open up your chart and it's like, oh, they have depression. <laughs> what is it? What are the, the signs and symptoms that you're seeing from them that kind of, you're like, yes, that's true. <laughs> Joyless. Joyless. Mm -hmm. Flat affect. Flat affect. Mm -hmm. Decreased initiation, remembering instructions the next day. Oh, they okay. They become like a new day, like, oh, you, oh, I, I forgot. Oh, I'm not showing any interest in it. Learning. Okay, so no interest in learning, uh, maybe inability to retain information, right? So when you're giving them exercises, go home and do this, right? These are your exercises for home. And they either can't remember to do it or they don't have that energy or that motivation to do it. Lack of focus. Attention. Lack of focus. Mm -hmm. Lack of focus, lack of attention, lack of concentration, right? You're like, no, your left, you know, your left hand. Your left hand. You're like, oh, right, this one. Mm -hmm. What else? What other What other things do you see? I think that goes along with hopelessness too. Like I have patients, um, for you know, a few of them um, oh, during my clinicals, where it's like they have so little interest in learning, but that's because they don't think it's ever going to get anywhere. Like, oh, mm -hmm. this isn't going to do anything. Nothing's wow. working. I yeah. can't, you know. And it, I just saw saw that go on and on, especially with mm -hmm. this one patient. In a skilled nursing facility for months and mm -hmm. she made very little progress because she sure. had so little interest in the activity she just thought it wouldn't help her yeah almost kind of giving up mm -hmm. right oh yeah mm -hmm. so so kind of that that feeling of hopelessness where what's the point of doing this nothing has worked so far i don't feel any better why should i keep doing this just oh right just that that weighted down feeling you can you can almost see them right Mm -hmm. Like maybe they even walk slower. Do you see where like, you know, kind of like the hunched over and walking slowly? Mm -hmm. So they usually sit there do nothing. So they are basically deconditioned. So that's why they also lack the energy and time. And sure. Bring something even if we ask them. To right. Do yeah. So lack of energy. Um, but so they've been sitting around and then they become deconditioned, like you said, right? So that makes them kind of that much weaker, right? The, the muscles are kind of atrophying. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right. So here we go. D symptoms of depression, right? So we talked about how it's impacting on kind of four different levels uh, of a person, right? So we've got emotional, um, sadness. Uh, the anxiety, which we talked about, kind of that, ooh, kind of all tied up. Um, guilt. Anybody guilt? Like, I should be better. I should be able to do this. Yeah, you know, I've seen some nodding heads. Yep. Mood swings. Any of your patients have mood swings? Yeah? yeah. Kind of, oh, okay, I can't do this. I do this. Oh, I did it. I did it. And, oh, but I won't be able to keep it going. A lot more vocal. <laughs> more vulgar. <too. laughs> they forget things. I work at, with TBIs. Oh, they work with TBIs. They don't forget the cuss words. The cuss words. <laughs> okay, so we've got somebody that works with TBI, um, and uh, and they may forget some things, but they don't forget the cuss words. I think that what is it? You learn a new language, and what are the first things you learn? The first words you learn the the cuss words in the in a different language, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, but absolutely, it could be very loud and vocal, right, about things. Um, or feeling numb, right, just, I don't feel anything, just, you know, we talked about kind of that flat affect. Um, helplessness, right, I can't do it. It's not even, it's not even a matter of there's no point, it's, I can't, I can't do this, right? You want me to, uh, you want me to gain this percentage of, of you know, movement on my leg or on my arm or something 
that's impossible. It hurts too much. I will never be able to do that. Like, I can't do it. I just physically can't. Or you want me to walk, you know, without assistance, this whole, this whole hallway, right? I, I just, I can't. I need your help. I need you here. I need you holding me. Um, I think people see that a lot in um, skilled nursing facilities or long-term care where okay. um, some of the residents after a while will get used to asking for the nurse's help for everything mm. so much that they're asking for help for things that they could otherwise do themselves and sometimes that could be due to depression because that's also not going on where I was doing clinical. Absolutely, absolutely. So we've got somebody that um, part of your clinicals, you were working in assisted living, nursing mm -hmm. home type place mm -hmm. and uh, found that um, the residents got more and more accustomed to always asking the nurse for help um, to the point where they were even asking for help to do things that they were able to do, right? And that kind of, some of that learned helplessness, um, absolutely. Irritability, any of your patients, probably TBI. <laughs> what are you doing? You don't know what you're doing. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, behavior, right? Crying spells. Anybody have patients that kind of out of nowhere will just break into tears? Not necessarily from the physical pain, but just kind of emotional stuff that's going on? Nodding heads. Isolation, right? Kind of not wanting to talk to you, not interacting. Uh, if you're in a place where kind of other people are, are doing PT at the same time, right? Not talking to any of the other patients, just this is what I'm going to do and I don't want to talk to you. Uh, neglect of responsibilities. So this might go to, you know, you give them homework. Go home. These are your home exercises. I need you to do this. Um, I need you to make an appointment. I need you to call me if you're not going to show for your appointment. Right? That, that lack, uh, the neglecting those responsibilities, kind of some of those, those basic things. Um, decline in daily activities. Right? Um, Kind of, uh, are, do you ever see people who um, you can tell maybe have not showered that day or have not showered recently? <laughs> Nodding heads, some laughter. <laughs> yep, yep. Same clothes, <laughs> right? Dirty clothes. Um, right. There's there's that that decline in in doing those those daily the daily functioning. Um, loss of interest in things that used to be enjoyable. Anybody got any examples of that? Somebody that maybe they used to love to talk about their grandkids or uh, talk about how um, they love going to movies or cooking or doing something. And then you're like, hey, how are those cute grandkids? I don't know. I haven't talked to them. They're fine. They're just too busy, right? Uh, loss of motivation. Um, slow movement, right? Again, we talked about kind of the walking like this, right? And not because physically they're, they're incapable, they're unable to walk faster, but because it's literally sometimes like they're just, they have a weight attached to them. Um, use of alcohol and drugs, right? Maybe they're doing that a little bit more often or a lot more often sometimes. Uh, thoughts, so thoughts that are going on. A lot of self-criticism. I am no good. I, I'm, I'm terrible at this, right? It's the, this is my fault. Um, Self-blame, right? It's my fault that I'm here. I should be better. I should be farther along. I should have made more progress. Um, or if they have a setback, right, physically. Oh, you know, I just lost all that work. This is, I'm stupid. I can't do this. Um, worry, pessimism, right? We, Definitely talked about that, right? Like, this is never going to work. I can't do this or doesn't work, right? What if I don't get better? You know, you say I'm going to return to this level of functioning. Well, what if I don't? How do you know? Um, impaired memory, concentration, right? We talked about that. Not being able to focus. Um, indecisiveness, maybe some confusion. Uh, and then thoughts of death and suicide. Physical, um, and here's the thing, right? Depression, <laughs> it, it's not just up in your head and it doesn't stay there, right? It, it hits us everywhere. You've got the chronic fatigue. You have the lack of energy, sleeping too much or too little. You know, I can't sleep. I sleep for two hours and then I'm awake 
I'm awake all night. Uh, overeating, right? Eating everything inside, I'm just always hungry. Or lack of appetite, I'm not eating anything. Um, constipation, weight gain, weight loss. Uh, headaches, unexplained aches and pains. So one of the things I wanna ask you, um, do you have any patients that you've seen more than once, right? For, and, and I'm not talking for like one session, right? Like they, you work with them, they're really not making any progress, you discharge them, and then you, know, you get another order, right? They'll come back you know, maybe a couple of months later, kind of at the same place, maybe a little bit worse. You're working, 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 no progress, discharge, kind of come back. Anybody have kind of some experiences with that? Couple, yeah. Maybe it's not lack of their willingness, right? Maybe they're, they're not being stubborn, right? They're not being, quote unquote, bad patients. Maybe there's something psychological going on with them. Maybe there's some depression that's hitting them and they're dealing with all of this stuff, right? And it's, it's an inability to be able to do it or that's how their depression is manifesting, right? Like. <laughs> You know, we keep working on my leg, we keep working on my leg, and, and it just it doesn't get any better, and we're doing all these exercises, but it still hurts, it hurts, it hurts. That could very well be a symptom of their depression. And you could do everything right. You could do everything that you're supposed to be doing, right? Doing these exercises and everything, and that pain is still going to be there because there's something else going on. And, and, and that's okay. I think it's important to recognize that you're not necessarily going to have all of the solutions for everybody, especially somebody that's dealing with depression, somebody that's dealing with a mental illness, right? You can be doing everything right, following everything by the book, pouring your heart and soul into your work with this, this person. If there's something else psychological going on, they might not get better unless they address some of that stuff going on, some, some of those other issues, right? So. I don't know kind of what type of practice everybody works in, but it might be worth knowing that it's okay to go to the doctor and say, hey, I know you put in this order, here's what I'm seeing and I really think that there might be something else going on. I really think that they need to address and maybe go see a counselor or go see a psychiatrist or something along those lines. You're not always gonna have a, a sore leg, right, a sore arm, is not always just a sore arm. There's something else going on there. It happens, you know, after the longest time. I work in a rehab, but a lot of times we see new admissions. Like uh -huh. Depression diagnosis is not actually there, but when you see some of the symptoms, they have a psychologist on the staff. So oh, you do? Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Okay, so we've got somebody here that, that works in, in rehab um, and uh, new admissions that come in and if, if they don't have a diagnosis of, of depression, right, but you're starting to see kind of some signs, some symptoms, um, that's fantastic that you're able to put in a, uh, a request for like a psychological evaluation to address that piece of it too, right? We don't operate in, in, in silos, right? Something that's going on in our head, you can't just treat that. A lot of times it's, it's happening in our body, right, or in our relationships. Um, you can't just treat something that's, that's in the body because that's impacting our brain, right? I have a question. Yes. The parts of the tennis suicide, they do come at the impulse or they like talk about it all the time or they keep it themselves and then they find out, oh, they committed suicide. So that's, that's, a, that's a great question, um, and we're going to get into some of the meat of the stuff coming up. So the question was, um, when it comes to kind of the thoughts of death and suicide, is that something that uh, a person is always going to be talking about, or do they keep it inside um, and kind of carrying on, quote unquote, as normal, and then all of a sudden you, you find out that, that they've attempted or that they've completed suicide. Um, we're gonna get into that, right? We're gonna get into the risk factors, warning signs of suicide, um, and kind of what that looks like. Yeah, great question, thank you. That was a perfect segue. <laughs> um, so all of this, you know, symptoms of depression and kind of what I was talking about how, um, 
you know, sometimes the, the hurt leg or the, the sore muscles are not necessarily the sore muscles, right? It could be a symptom of uh, something else psychologically going on. Um, it's possible that some of these symptoms can come across as something else, right? So the flat affect, it, it can be very easy sometimes to think, oh, that person's just being really rude, right? They're just a jerk. Mm -hmm. Or like, great, I have to work with Mr. Krabby tonight, right? The one who's just all grumbly and things like that. It, it's very easy for kind of some of these symptoms to come across as, oh, you're just lazy, right? You're, you're not concentrating, you're not focusing, you're just being lazy, don't you want to get better? It's, it's sometimes too easy, right, to, to kind of take that, that aspect or kind of take that approach to it. So um, important to kind of take a step back and, and make sure you're looking at the bigger picture, right? Um, Okie dokie. Here we go. We're going to go through this pretty quickly because then we're going to get into um, our suicide. And we go until what time? Quarter till, right? 7.45? Okay, thank you. Good. All right, risk factors for depression. Um, you guys are going to see the, these top two, I'm sure, all the time, right? Dealing with an illness that is life-threatening, right? An illness that is chronic. Uh, an illness that is associated with pain. Uh, medical conditions. Um, so you've got, so the, the illness, you know, threat, life-threatening chronic associated with pain, right? A car accident or a sports injury, right? A lot of pain going on with that. Um, the medical conditions, so you've got dementia, you've got Alzheimer's, you have stroke, you have TBI, um, you've also got uh, Parkinson's disease, right? Huntington's disease, um, hypothyroidism. Um, what are some other examples? What are some other kind of conditions that you've run into where you're like, oh yeah, this kind of makes sense is possibly putting a person at a higher risk for depression. Cancer. Cancer. Mm -hmm. yep. Which one? Uh, MS. Oh, oh yeah. ALS. ALS. Fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia. Right. Kind of that chronic pain everywhere. Mm hmm Yeah, definitely. Um, you've also got suffering a loss, and a loss can be obviously the loss of a loved one, right? The death of someone. Um, but it can also be loss of a job. It could be loss of a relationship, uh, loss of autonomy, right? I used to be fine. I didn't have to rely on anybody, and now I can't go to the bathroom by myself. Now I can't dress myself. Um, recent childbirth. Uh, you know, kind of studies show, right, um, postpartum depression, right, that is a true and real thing. The hormones are all out of whack and, and, and suddenly you're, you're kind of thrown for a loop. Um, it could be a side effect of medications, unfortunately. Um, chemical imbalance, right, so neurotransmitters. So getting a little science-y with you guys for a quick minute. Um, so there's, there's uh, changes, there can be changes in the brain chemicals. So natural brain chemicals, neurotransmitters, right? And you guys probably know this. I'm sure you learned this. I'm just going to give a quick, quick. <laughs> um, so the chemicals, right, they, they send messages from one nerve cell to the other, right? Serotonin. Um, depression is a reduction in certain neurotransmitters, right? So all of a sudden, you don't have as many of those messages going. Right, you may have a reduction in, in serotonin. Um, that's why a lot of antidepressants look at, at impacting the serotonin um, neurotransmitters. Um, okay, so going for the next, right before I get to the next slide, so we're gonna be delving into suicide. Uh, what do you folks think? Um, who's more likely to, uh, who's more likely to attempt suicide, males or females? Males? Females. Females? Okay. Does, it cha does your answer change if I say who's more likely to complete suicide, males or females? Males. 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 <laughs> I like that. It's like, I know this one. Um, okay. What about age? What age is kind of the biggest risk for suicide? Teenagers. 
teenagers. Any other answers? You mentioned kind of 80 plus before. Do you still think that they'd be more risk? Do you th so for depression, do you think that they're more at risk for suicide? Okay. Okay. All right. Drum roll. <laughs> All right. So males. Males are four times more likely to die by suicide, right? To complete. Females attempt suicide three times, but it reminds me of you. I want you to have it. Are they doing things to kind of tidy up loose ends? Oh, I need to make sure I pay my bill totally in full you know, so that we're all set and kind of closed out, right? I don't, want, I don't want family members to have to worry about this. Feeling hopeless or worthless. Acting recklessly or engaging in risky activities, right? They kind of came in, oh gosh, how'd you get that scratch? Oh, I don't know, I, you know, I just, I wanted to cross the road, I was tired, I didn't want to wait for traffic, so I just kind of ran, right? It was all good, no problem. I made it, see, right? Again, kind of that, that impulsive, not thinking about it. I'm just gonna kind of go and do it. And that could be even um, getting more irritated, right? Somebody bumps into you and all of a sudden, instead of being like, guy, really, you know, come on. Instead it could be, oh, what are you doing? You wanna start a fight? You wanna start a fight, right? Like, let's get into it. Feeling trapped. There's no way out. It's hopeless. Nothing's ever going to get better. Increasing the alcohol or drug use, right? And again, that's where you're going to get into a little bit more of that impulsive, right? That's, that's bringing down that uh, you're, you're tampering, right? You're, you're putting that little, wait, don't do it voice. You're making them go to sleep with more alcohol or drug use. Withdrawing, right? Withdrawing from friends and family. Again, kind of stopping that contact. Um, how are the grandkids? I don't know. I haven't talked to them. They'd be better off without me. I don't know. I don't see them anymore. No, I, I, I don't have time for anybody. I just I don't really want to see them. Um, another thing I just want to, oh, oh, we're going to get to that. Uh, appearing agitated, right? Kind of all the time, everything just, well, why are you doing that? Why are you saying that, right? Just kind of a heightened level. Um, demonstrating rage or anger or kind of seeking revenge type behavior, right? So somebody may be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to show them. They're really going to miss me when I'm gone. Um, I'll, I, they're they're going to be sorry. They're really, they're really going to be sorry that they treated me like this or that they don't talk to me, right? I'm, I'm going to show them. This, is, this will really get to them. Having a dramatic mood, change in mood. And this one's kind of weird until you kind of think about it, right? So you could have somebody that's very depressed, sad, hopeless, and then all of a sudden they're like, hey, hi, how are you? What's going on? Yeah, it's a good day. Things are, yeah, no, we're, we're really good. No, it's good. Yeah, you know what? Everything's going to get taken care of. Why that switch? Why is that something to be worried about? Could be because they've made a decision. They've made a decision that, okay, this is it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to take my life. And it takes away that, uh, it brings about a sense of resolution for them because they have made that choice because they're like, Things are really, really hard, but you know what? This is it. This is my way out. This is going to make it all better. I won't be in any pain anymore. I won't be sick anymore. Nobody's going to have to take care of me. I'm not going to be a burden anymore. I feel peaceful. I'm not struggling with this anymore. So you may find somebody, right? These are warning signs. You may find somebody that has one or more of these, um, you might have somebody who maybe doesn't necessarily show one or the other, right? That's why I kind of have your little feelers out there, right? You're looking at the big picture, kind of their, their entire presentation throughout your time with them. 
So what do you do? You're seeing these warning signs, right? What do you do? You're asking questions. And these questions are kind of hard to ask, right? You are directly asking that person. And of course, it goes without saying that you are pulling this person into a private place to speak, right? Confidentiality. This is not in the middle of a group therapy session or something like that. Mm -hmm. Caveat, I know you guys are all on board with that. But you're asking directly, you are actually asking, are you having thoughts of suicide? Are you thinking about killing yourself? You're saying those words. If yes, or if hesitation, or if, well, not exactly. Okay, we're gonna talk, that's, I'm considering that a yes, right? Let's talk a little bit more about that. You wanna follow it up? Ask whether the person has a plan. Have you decided how you're gonna kill yourself? Have you decided when you're gonna do it? Have you collected the things you need to carry out your plan? Right? We're looking at, we're at severe high acuity, right? But the more developed a plan, the higher the risk, right? If they've gotten to the point where they're like, well, let's see, I definitely wanna do it before I turn 30. My birthday is next Thursday, so I think the best is going to be on Tuesday because nobody's going to be home. So um, I'm going to go to this particular secluded place in the woods that's by my house because I know nobody will be around and interrupt me. Or, well, I know that this train schedule, right? And I live really close to the station. I know what time the train comes by. Right? How detailed is their plan? And do they have access to the means? You also look at um, age a little bit with this, right? So again, you're looking at kind of the, are they intoxicated? Are they using drugs and alcohol? Um, what is kind of their mental capacity? Teenagers, their little brains are not fully functional and not fully developed. They are so impulsive. Right? Kind of in a heartbeat, they could go from I love you to I hate you. Right? And that's just being a teenager. They could be in that deep, dark place and immediately they're like, oh, well, this is it, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to kill myself, and here I'm going to take action. Right? Impulsive. So, <laughs> I would imagine very much kind of a reaction is, oh my God, what are you doing? I can't ask those questions. You're, you're kidding me, right? Like, I, I, I can't say that. I can't say suicide. I can't ask a person, are you thinking about suicide? Are you thinking about killing my, your, yourself, right? It's going to put the thought in their head. I don't want to make it seem okay that they're doing it. That's not true, right? I guarantee you if somebody's thinking about suicide and it's to the point where you're recognizing risk symptoms, risk factors, you are not putting the idea in their head. Not putting the idea in their head. In fact, there may be some relief. It's like, oh, finally, you brought out the taboo subject. Okay, I've been thinking this and having this thought. And you just said it. Okay, that means it's okay for me to talk about it. Right? It's kind of that, okay. All right. You've noticed. You care. Nobody else cares, but you noticed and you said something. Right? There's also kind of the, uh, you know, somebody who talks about suicide, they're not really serious, right? How many people, oh my God, I want to kill myself because of this happened. Um, this pain is so bad. I, I just, I'm, I, I can't take it anymore. I'm just going to, you know, I'm not coming back, right? Next time you, you can see, I'll see you at my funeral. <laughs> right? I think everybody is, has said or heard kind of jokes along those lines, right? Uh, my friends and family members have learned very quickly now by now <laughs> that uh, you don't joke about it, right? Because I'm always going to be, I'm like, oh, let's talk. <laughs> um, you know, it's just like you don't, you don't say bomb in an airplane. You don't bring up suicide if you don't want it to be taken seriously. Um, yeah, it's, it's anytime you've got those warning signs, take it seriously, right? And it, it's possible they may say, oh my gosh, no, I wasn't thinking about that at all. Okay, well, good. 
good. I just wanted to check in with you because I'm, I'm, because I'm worried, because I'm seeing some of this stuff. How are you doing? Are you doing okay? I'm a little worried because you seem a little sad, right? This is, this is why I'm asking you. This is why I'm having this conversation. Nobody's ever going to be mad at you for caring. Nobody's ever going to be mad. Um, so, saying the questions. Uh, I would recommend um, practicing, right? Practice saying those things. It feels really weird. And you're like, but you don't want the first time you say it for real, you know, the first time you ask those questions and you actually say those words to be when you need to be, right? In a situation, in a real live, you know, situation. So, you know, go home, talk to your friends and family and be like, so I had this really interesting seminar and I'm going to ask you a question now and you don't have to respond. I just have to practice asking <laughs> and explain, right? But have, are you having thoughts of suicide? Because think about it. How do you want to say this? Do you want to be like, oh my God, are you having thoughts of suicide? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, what are you doing? Right? Or... Are you having thoughts of suicide? <laughs> like, really, not really, right? How do you want to say it? Because that makes a big difference. So how do we talk to them, right? I gave a little example there with my wake up. <laughs> um, you know, so first and foremost, you're letting the person know that you're concerned and that you're willing to help, right? You're there. This doesn't have to be kind of this Hollywood moment right? To be real. Be like, hey, you know, I care about you. I, this is kind of what I'm seeing. I, I just want to check in. How, how are things? How are you? Right? You're discussing your observations. What is it that you've noticed? What are those warning signs that you notice that kind of put you on alert? Right? Ask the question without dread. Right? Again, you're not doing the, oh my God, are you thinking about suicide? Right? Um, don't express a negative judgment, right? That's not where, that's not the point where that's, that's not the right time to be like, well, you can't do that. You know, you're going to go to hell, right? Or why would you ever do that? Do you know what that's going to do to your friends? Do you know what that's going to do to your family? Why would you do that? Trust me, they've had all of those thoughts already, right? That's up in their brain. They, they don't need that from somebody else who's looking to help them. Um, be confident, right? This could be reassuring for them. Again, they could be living with these thoughts and kind of in this deep, dark place for a long, long time. And to just to have somebody who kind of comes and says, so this is what I'm noticing. And I want to ask you directly, and it may seem weird, but I care about you, right? Be confident. Don't be scared. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Because I've kind of made these comments. Or you're kind of doing this, and I just, I really need to check in and see if you're okay, right? Check for two other things. Has the person been using alcohol or other drugs? Or have they made an attempt in the past, right? Those are the two things that really take it to a higher, more critical level, right? They are at higher, higher risk of attempting or completing. If they're under the influence or uh, if they've made an attempt in the past. You definitely, like once you get to this point, that's what you need to check for. Um, okay. All right, biggest thing that you are going to be doing with people is listening non-judgmentally. And you think listening, great, I've got two ears. I was born with them, I don't have to think about it, they just work, right? Not quite as easy as that, unfortunately. To be an effective, non-judgmental listener, you want to pay attention to two areas, right? So you're looking, what are your own attitudes? And how are they conveyed, right? What is it? What are your beliefs? And how does that come through? And then the use of effective communication skills, both verbal and nonverbal. So you're, you're wanting to focus, this is, at this point, this, like if any other part or experience in your life, this is so not about you, this is about the other person, right? 
This is all about their thoughts, their feelings, their experiences, right? Where they are right now in this moment. You really want to make sure that you're checking in with yourself, right? So that you're in kind of a, a good spot to be able to go and talk to them and not be carrying. We all have our own thoughts, beliefs, opinions, right? Can't be carrying that into this conversation. Um, Again, that goes to the no negative judgments, the no negative comments, things along those lines. So make sure you're kind of in that right, right frame of mind to be able to come into this kind of in a healthy way. And maybe you're not, right? And that's okay at that point, right? Kind of tag a co colleague, a coworker, and be like, hey, I need your help with this. This is kind of what's going on um, for whatever reason, right? I can't do this in the way it needs to be done, I need your help, all right? Focusing on the needs of the other person to be heard, to truly feel understood, right, and to be safe. And that's, that's you know, again, right, you want to kind of bring them in. This is just a safe place. You can, right, you can say everything that you need, everything you're talking and feeling. So key attitudes, right? So you are making sure that they feel acceptance. And that is where, again, right, the, the non-judgment, whatever their thoughts, their belief, right, that's true to, to you. That's true to them. It doesn't have to be yours. It doesn't have to be what you live with, right? That's, that's their reality. And it's okay. And make sure that you're being, and it goes kind of then into genuineness, right? Make sure that you're reflecting that. You know, there's, there's something to be said about, okay, you know, so, so you're thinking about killing yourself, so talk to me about that. What's, what's going on, right? Versus, you know, I have a strong judgment against it, and I'm going to talk to you, right? So I have this kind of contrary belief, and I'm trying to talk to you and be genuine, but I'm like, so talk to me about this. This is what you're thinking. Really? You haven't. Okay. So I don't understand, right? This is really going to hurt somebody. This is going to hurt your family or your loved one, right? If, if you're not, again, if you're carrying kind of those judgments, those, that belief system that you have into this conversation and it's contrary where they're at, you're not going to have that good connection, right? They'll put a smile on their face. They're going to lie to you. They're going to say, oh, no, no, ha, 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 just kidding, right, if they don't feel safe. So there is an empathy. And empathy is not, empathy is not pity, right? It is not, oh, you poor, poor thing. Oh, it must be horrible to be you. Not helpful. <laughs> not helpful, right? It's, and it's not, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. I know exactly how you're feeling. In fact, I had this similar experience when da, 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 da. No, that's not empathy, right? Empathy is, wow, that sounds really hard. I can, I can understand why you'd be struggling with this. I can see that you're having a really hard time, right? That's empathy. All right, then we want to get into our nonverbal skills, right? So we want to make sure we're showing attentiveness, comfortable eye contact, right? You don't want to talk to somebody and be like, no, really. Um, no, okay, so you're thinking about killing yourself. You're really depressed. Um, okay, so tell me. Tell me about that, right? Tell me why that's why you feel like that. Nope. Same time, you do not want to be like, okay, you're depressed. Tell me about that. What is that like? What's going on? <laughs> Creepy, <laughs> right? Appropriate eye contact, right? We're, we're Goldilocks here, just right in the middle. Not too much, not too little. Um, kind of look to, look to your person that you're talking to, right? They're, they're, going to, they're really going to mirror the type of contact and communication that they need, right? I mean, if they're looking right at you, okay, so kind of, it's okay to look away and glance away and be like, wow, that must be hard, okay, continue. Um, open body posture, right? 
so no really I, I care you know tell me what's going on no really I want to hear what does that feel like <laughs> does that feel warm does that feel opening you know does that feel inviting right no open body contact open body position um, sitting rather than standing right there's there's a little bit of kind of a power imbalance you're sitting I'm standing right I'm looking down on you tell me what's going on um, it can be difficult to do kind of the straight on because these are really hard things that a person is talking about that they're dealing with uh, maybe they've never talked about it before um, so actually sitting next to a person rather than kind of straight on you just kind of just kind of angle your body a little bit right if you think about it um, you know think about in the car it's for some reason it's so much easier to have conversations in the car about things you really don't want to talk about I don't know if any of you have, have experienced that like you've got a friend or family member or child or something right like the car is the best place to have those conversations sometimes um, I've got a colleague she's she's brilliant she's like no radio in the car ever because that's when we have check-in time I'm like that's really smart right Who is driving? well the person's driving right like they're she's driving but she's got you know she's got the hubby here she's got the kids back there right but everybody's looking forward you're not having to make that uncomfortable eye contact sometimes you can kind of distract yourself like oh we're just driving no it's all good it's non-threatening no it's okay tell me tell me about that thing that's happening right tell me about that uh that test that you failed tell me about that fight that you got into right here let me tell you about uh you know this presentation that i totally screwed up at work right it's a little bit comfortable if i'm if i'm like this i'm not straight on you know but i can kind of talk to you like this um yeah don't fidget right this is not the time to be right the person is again right not about you it's about this other person that's their fo that's your focus that's what's that's what you want to focus on all right verbal skills right how do you show that you're actively listening you're not just sitting there like a potato right you're gonna ask questions um, restate and summarize right show ask questions to make sure that you're understanding where they're coming from like no I don't really can you help me understand that can can you explain what that what that's like for you so okay so I just want to make sure I'm, I'm truly understanding so um, you know so it's been really hard at home you don't feel like you have any support um, and and you're just kind of feeling really lost is that right listen to their tone how they are saying things is going to tell you a little bit right just like we have to watch our tone when we're talking to them we can pick up a whole lot from them um, use minimal prompts right ah, I see you know this is not where you're gonna be like oh tell me about that hmm right this is gonna be a much more natural thing right like oh okay uh-huh right all those 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 little kind of throwaway things that we all do um, be patient um, and kind of on top of that uh, don't be afraid of silence and silence is really hard for a lot of people people aren't talking and everybody's just kind of sitting there and it gets really uncomfortable you got to check in with yourself is that uncomfortableness is that is that just you right is the patient sitting there are they thinking you can tell right you can a lot of times a person's eyes will be moving right that's it love the human brain right that's their thought process kind of going back and forth right their two parts of their brain is communicating maybe they're reliving an experience maybe they're uh, they've never said this before so they're trying to find the right words um, maybe they're like okay I'm just gonna deep breathe for a minute so I don't cry right be patient let them get to where they need to go um, and don't interrupt right yeah so I've been really sad at, at home and oh you've been really sad at home tell oh yeah tell me about that right let them tell their story let them tell their experience um, 
avoid unhelpful advice, right? Again, the, well, that doesn't sound so bad. Why don't, why don't you just, uh, why don't you just get up and try and exercise more? You'll feel better. You'll have more energy. Well, you know, maybe you just need to try harder, right? This goes back to, this goes back to my lovely little slide, right, of my comics. Um, well, it, maybe you, you, you just need to snap out of it, right? Just kind of get over it. Well, that's not so bad. Can't you just get over it? You know, well, why does that bother you? Really not helpful. Um, and avoid confrontation, right? This is not a battle of egos. This is not, right? They want to be like, they want to get up kind of in your face. They want to, well, duh, right? Well, you don't know anything. Well, yeah, I do. You, you're not seeing all of this. Well, yes, I have. I've seen you do this and this and this. What are you talking about? Don't fight them. Just be like, okay, so I'm wrong? Okay, so you seem really upset right now. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Right? We're not looking at escalating this to a confrontation. That's not going to be helpful. Uh, so, what is not supportive, right? Again, tell the person, snap out of it. It's easy. Get over it. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, <coughs> acting, the blessing, acting hostile or sarcastic, right? This is not the place where, well, pff, really? So you're, you're going to kill yourself over that? Well, that's stupid. This is not, again, not helpful, not comforting. <laughs> Uh, don't blame the person for the symptoms, right? They're, trust me, again, they are not wanting to feel like this. They would not feel like this if they could. It was within their power. Another thing, don't become super over-involved or over-protective, right? So this, okay. I understand exactly what you're doing. This is ex so this is what you need to do. You need to get on a schedule, right? You need to start going to bed at this time. You need to get up at this time and you need to eat breakfast and then you need to go for a walk and you do No. Right? Or so you're going to go see a therapist cuz you are depressed and you need to go and you need to work through your childhood issues with your mom or your dad. This is the only way you're going to feel better, so you need to go and do that. Again, no. You can offer suggestions, right? But you can't be like, you have to do this. It's up to, it's kind of up to that person, right? And obviously that goes without saying if somebody is at suicide risk and they are expressing, yes, I want to kill myself. I'm having these thoughts. I have a plan, right? We're going to 911, right? There's no, you have a choice about whether you're going to get help. You're going to 911, right? You're going to the ER. You're going to the hospital. Um, don't nag the person to do what he would, she would normally do, right? Well, you know, you used to get up, you used to, you know, you used to work out, you used to run, what, that's what you should be doing again, right? You felt good when you were doing that, you need to get back to doing that. You used to come to PT uh, twice a week, right? We were doing really good, we were getting progress, that's what you need to do again. Why aren't you doing it? You're only coming once a week. Um, you don't trivialize, trivialize the person's experiences, right? Again, well, that's a stupid thing to want to kill yourself over. I wouldn't be upset if that happened to me. You don't belittle or dismiss, dismiss the person's feelings. Speak with a patronizing tone. Well, of course you're going to feel like that if, if you, know, you haven't showered or, well, you know, if you hadn't have gotten into the fight with your mom, then this wouldn't have blown up and you wouldn't have these ongoing issues, right? Not helpful, not good. And don't try to cure the person. Um, studies show that uh, um, a person who could very much benefit, maybe, from talking to a therapist, kind of seeking out additional help, um, delays in getting help. Right? It could even take them up to like four years. I think stats show like a really high percentage of people. It takes them four years before they go see that psychiatrist, before they go see that therapist. Right? You're not there to cure them. You're not there to solve their problems. They are resilient, right? You don't want to take that away from them. You are all about kind of 
building them up, right? There's hope if you, if you practice, if we do this, this treatment plan, right? You're gonna be able to walk again. Uh, you're gonna be able to, you know, go to the bathroom by yourself, right? There's, there's hope, just like there's hope for somebody that's depressed or is having these thoughts. You know what? There's hope for you. You don't have to feel like this. You can feel better, right? With time, with treatment. You don't want to take that away, right? That the person can do this, that they can do it. You might need some help, right? You might need to kind of carry them a little, right? Maybe a therapist, counselor might need to really do some hands-on help, right? But they can do it. Um, so what does kind of appropriate professional help look like, right? Doctors, um, people get kind of real uncomfortable maybe going to see a psychiatrist or a social worker, counselor, something like that. Hey, you know what? I'm seeing this, you're seeing me really down. Have you talked to your primary care doctor about this? Maybe they could help you. Primary care doctors, they prescribe 80% of all the psych meds, 80%. They are the first place, right? They are a lot of times uh, the only place some people will go to talk about things like this, right? Um, types of professional help, right? You've got your traditional talk therapy, um, medication, um, a lot of times what we see, um, kind of doing both of those together, you get the one-two punch because you're working on that brain chemistry, right? That chemical imbalance, and then you're talking through. Um, so psychiatrists are just medication management. You're not going to go in and, well, I just want one person, and, and this is hard, right? We have to educate people. Oh, I just want to go talk to my doctor. I want somebody that's going to prescribe my meds, and then I could talk to them about everything that I'm feeling. Mm, doesn't work that way right? Psychiatrists, your first initial intake appointment, depending on the doctor, can be anywhere from like 20 minutes to 45 minutes. After that, right, we're looking at kind of like 15 minute, 20 minute, possibly 30 minute, right? Again, it, it's going to vary by, by psychiatrist, by doctor, but it is symptom management. It is medication management, right? You gotta go with a social worker, a counselor, um, psychologist uh, to do kind of that ongoing, that talk therapy, right? Processing through something, uh, working on distress tolerance, um, coping skills, uh, emotional regulation, things along those lines. Um, other professional supports, right? Um, you got support groups. Group is really powerful kind of knowing I'm not alone, I'm not the only one dealing with this, um, can be really impactful, right? Uh, so resources for everybody. So you've got the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Um, for those that are kind of here, you know, DuPage area, right? DuPage County Health Department has got Crisis Intervention Unit. So that's their 24 seven hotline number. Um, you know, for those that are um, kind of online or remote, I would encourage you, right, you've got the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, um, check out your uh, local community health department. Oftentimes, they should have a behavioral health uh, branch or department. Um, uh, kind of get familiar with if you have a behavioral health hospital or facility that's kind of in your area. Um, Linden Oaks, so those that are kind of, you know, kind of around here, relatively close, right? We have our own 24 seven hotline number. Um, again, right, this is the intake department, the, uh, the um, assessment and referral center, the ARC. Um, this is where I started. This is where I came from. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is, uh, right, so we'll do crisis intake, stabilization. So we've got inpatient. Um, uh, what you can also do with this number, right, you can schedule an outpatient intake department. So we have offices in 
St. Charles, uh, Hinsdale, Plainfield, as well as um, another outpatient center over in Naperville, right off of Mill Street. You can walk there. Um, you can make a free confidential assessment with a licensed behavioral health professional, right? It's a 90 minute process. Um, kind of find out where do you need to go, right? Do you need outpatient therapy, outpatient psychiatry? Do you need a higher level of care? Do you need, there are uh, things that are out there. Um, you can call them day programs, right? Partial hospitalization program or an in intensive outpatient program, right? Those are typically go Monday through Friday six hours a day or three hours a day, right? These are people who are really, really struggling, right? They're losing that functioning um, kind of daily activity. Um, but that number can help make that happen. Um, so I wanna kind of plug mental health first aid. So a lot of what I talked about today, uh, kind of all the signs and symptoms, um, risk factors, things like that, um, I definitely borrowed from mental health first aid. So this is a universe, this is a kind of worldwide uh, program um, created, it was started in Australia. Um, basically, the point of it is to teach members of the public how to respond in a mental health emergency and to offer support to someone who appears to be in emotional distress, right? You've got, uh, you've got CPR, this is mental health first aid. It's, it's basically that same equivalent, right? How do you recognize those warning signs? And it runs through the gamut, right? Obviously, we, we touched on depression and suicide risk, um, but this goes into anxiety, um, uh, drug use, eating disorder, um, you know, schizophrenia, right? Kind of hallucinations, hearing and seeing things. Um, and kind of what do you do, right? Because again, these people do not exist in a vacuum. Right? They're not just in this little corner. They are out amongst us. They are your patients. Um, they may be in your church. They are uh, everywhere. Right? They're at the library. They're at school. Um, so if anybody's interested, it is, a, uh, it is an eight-hour program. Um, Lyndon Oaks uh, has got a couple of, of um, seminars that they're doing around in the area. If you have any questions and you're interested, Go ahead and email there. Um, these are all my resources. Um, that's about it. Any questions? Yes? What does suicide like, typically look like in like your 85 plus year old who's completely debilitated mm -hmm. um, and can't really move or administer their own medication? Right. Um, so, there have absolutely been times where we've had kind of a in, in admission for inpatient, uh, somebody that is supposedly taking their meds, but they're keeping them, right? They're secreting them away so that they can do an attempted overdose, so they can attempt to overdose. Um, it could also be um, maybe they get a partner Right, somebody that understands and gosh, and I hate to see you like this, and I hate to see you in so much pain. Okay, I'll help you, right, kind well, of thing. What happens to that person if that person really committed suicide and friend or somebody else to help? Well, yeah, I mean that's that's kind of a whole other issue, right? Then you're looking into, you know, here in the state of Illinois, um, assisted suicide is not legal. Um, then you start getting into Kind of more ethical, larger, uh, legal dilemmas. Um, so I don't necessarily have an answer for that. Yeah. Any other questions? Did this feel helpful? Does uh, does does this kind of resonate? Are you seeing patients? that you're like, oh, I'm thinking, oh, you just said that. It reminds me of this patient, or that reminds me of this person. Yeah. Do you feel more comfortable if it got to this point, if, if somebody was showing warning signs of suicide? Do you, do you feel kind of more equipped to kind of be able to address that? Okay. 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 All right. Thank you so much, Megan. Absolutely. Were there any uh, questions out there from virtual? No? 
Thank you, uh, Megan, again. Okay. All right. I really appreciate that. Perfect. One question. Oh, good. Yes. Uh, do you provide a lot of counseling for elderly homebound? Any suggestions for support that is different than what you've already said? So, uh, so the question is, do I does so does Linda Noakes I think specifically provide support for homebound, um, and then other additional supports for uh, for that population? Okay. Um, Linda Noakes does not offer in-home counseling or those types of services. Uh, there are absolutely some wonderful services that are around. Um, I can speak to the ones that I know kind of in this area. Um, there is a provider, there is a practice that's called in-home counseling for seniors. Uh, you can do a Google, Google search and they'll pop up. Um, they're fantastic. I love them. I use them all the time whenever I have an appropriate patient. Uh, they will go out to the house and they will do right that that counseling, um, and it is not uh, it's not just um, counsel. Uh, sorry, it's not just for seniors. They will actually come for kind of any population, any age range. Um, obviously, you're more inclined to probably get some some seniors, but absolutely, if there's an issue with childcare or transportation barriers or things along those lines, uh, these these counselors, these providers will still go out to the house um, to provide counseling services. And I just want to remind you all, in order to earn CE for this, you do need to complete your evaluation that was sent to you with the reminder. So again, Megan, thank you for covering Absolutely. such a sensitive but important, very important subject. Absolutely. So we yeah. really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank Great. You. Thank, you. thank you, everyone. Thank you.